To everyone's surprise, Llama 3.1's paper is actually an engineering masterpiece and not really a research one. Like if you have been following this channel for a while, you know exactly what kind of wonky research masterpieces I have been talking about. On the one hand, we have AI within an AI. On the other, we have AI with 1 million tiny experts. Things are really getting wild out there. Meanwhile, Meta just dropped one of the most down to earth papers, which might completely disrupt the entire AI industry in a whole other way that those fancy papers probably won't ever be able to do. Because in this 90 page research paper they have published, the meta pretty much shared word for word on how exactly they have trained their state of the art large language model Llama 3.1, which is slightly better than ChatGPT and nearly on par with Plot 3.5 Sonnet, which is currently the best AI model out there. So if you have the right talent, money, and insanity, theoretically Llama 3.1 is pretty much completely replicable or might even be cheaper as they have already done the costly experiments for you. Well, technically the model is already out there for you to download for free, so you don't really need to replicate it from scratch. But how detailed is the research really? Well, if you can sit through this video, you would pretty much learn how a state-of-the-art AI chatbot is made from the ground up, along with some nuggets of wisdom here and there. But first, what's all the fuzz about Llama 3.1? So Llama 3 was actually announced a few months ago. However, at that time, Meta did not release their biggest model with 405 billion parameters and only teased us with its benchmarks as it was still undergoing training. But at that time, the performance of the smaller models shook the entire industry as people learned that there's no new fancy tricks for Llama 3 with basically the same architecture design from their Llama 2 series a year ago, yet top the chart like it's something revolutionary. And all it took for them this time was to spend 10 times more training time and 10 times more high quality data compared to Llama 2 to achieve state of the art a few months ago. So everyone wants to know what exact voodoo magic happened during that 10x of seemingly basic ideas being executed. And this time, with the announcement of Llama 3.1, they not only released a new series of AP and 70B models, but also the long anticipated 405 billion parameters model on top of a 90 page research paper of how they have done it. And after reading all of it, I have to be honest, I fell asleep twice. Well, I would say it's a bit boring on a research level, like nothing crazily revolutionary was applied. However, However, from an engineering perspective, it is probably every LLM developer's goldmine. It's like you're lost in the jungle and someone just handed you a map and a GPS completely for free. That's meta right here. Zuck did mention that they open source stuff like this so the industry would standardize on it which will in return save them money. Wall Street on the other hand did not like this. But that's not my money, why would I care? Okay so now imagine you're thrown into a jungle with an AI architecture called Transformers and in order to survive and escape, you have have to recreate the Llama 3.1405 billion parameters model. So how do you do it? First of all, if you don't know how a transformer works, it's not really that bad. You're just probably not going to make it out of the jungle, but you can still easily plug and play it without much hassle. And the transformer Llama 3 uses is a bit different than the 2017 version from the original attention is all you need paper. Other than the major changes of the self attention being replaced with group query attention to save attention compute, Llama 2 is also a decoder only architecture and the encoder part is completely discarded. Then we can stack this decoder only transformer layer together 126 times and with the addition of tokenizers that converts words into numbers for calculations and various other components, we can then reach around 405 billion parameters. With this, we have technically recreated the Llama 3.1 model but that is only architecturally. We now need some voodoo magic for it to match its capabilities. As AI models can see text like us, they would see a sequence of numbers which is called tokens instead. So this thing called bipair encoding is then used as a method of converting text into tokens and converting it back to text losslessly. So the larger the set of vocabs an encoder has, the better it is at compressing words. So in Llama 3.1's case, to better compensate for multilingual tasks with its 128k vocab tokens, they distributed 28k to better support non-English languages which ends up with a compression ratio of one token to 3.94 characters. Since they also plan to have a context window of 128k tokens, which is the max span a model can read and generate. They use rotary position embedding aka rope to incorporate positional information into the input tokens by rotating them into a multi-dimensional space at a base frequency of 500k which can better support attention between words up to 32k context tokens. So now that is probably the most technical part of the video and with that being gone, it is time to finally start training the big boy model. Well, not yet. Training a 
model that big without any point of reference for what the ideal model would look like is a bit too risky. So a scaling law is needed where it can roughly predict the optimal model size and its performance on benchmarks for a given set of hyperparameters. While the researchers at Meta could have used the pre-existing scaling laws, but there are two major problems with those. The first point is that it lacks a wide range of info including performance prediction given a model size and compute. Second, the scaling laws that have been previously proposed can be unreliable and noisy because they are developed based on runs that only have small budgets. I didn't say that by the way, the Meta researchers did. So by having a better control on the experiment variables, they can create their own compute optimal scaling law from the smaller models where it predicts task performance given a specific number of training flops for a compute optimal models which can be used to predict larger models like 405 billion parameters. So I want to quickly mention this type of diagram called isoflops curve which represents a trade-off space between hyperparameters like different model architectures or optimization strategies with the same computational cost. But some aspects like accuracy, inference speed, and memory usage are not included here. The minimum of the parabola represents the compute optimal pre-training budget. And the researchers also observed that the isoflops curves would become flatter as the compute budget increases, which implies that the 405B model is relatively robust to small changes in trade-off between model size and training tokens. So aside from the physical hardware constraints, this is also how they end up with hyperparameters like 126 transformer layers, 128 attention heads, and a training budget of 3.8 times 10 to the power of 25 flops as the optimal compute for a 405B model. So this is where we can actually start training the model. <laughs> you thought. We just talked about the compute, of course we need to talk about the hardware too, right? While the training infrastructure is a whole other technical subject, the Llama 3.1's paper was not shy about sharing how they were able to train a model this big. If you have money, buying GPUs is easy. The hard part is to make them all work together, especially efficiently as a unit. If you have ever ran an AI model locally yourself, it is just as simple as loading it onto your VRAM. But for a model that has 405 billion parameters, you would need to spread the model parameters across thousands of GPUs and synchronize them all to operate them. In Meta's case, they have this production cluster that has 16K H100s with 80GB HBM3, aka a faster VRAM, with an 8 GPU to 2 CPU ratio where the CPUs are used for loading and unloading a model. To communicate this many GPUs that may even be across the globe, they use the technique called MAST, which helps to schedule complex ML training workloads, which you can also check out its paper if you want. And this efficiency is really important because when you have this many GPUs, some slight delay in the scheduling would easily cause a chain reaction of downtime, and with how expensive each of these GPUs are, you would lose 640 bucks market price every minute you idle it. Another mind-boggling problem that training models this huge would be saving checkpoints during the training. Like if one GPU fails, the training run might be as good as being lost. So saving checkpoints are important and this is also the part where CPUs are needed. And an interesting observation that researchers have made is that the saving operation is usually synced across all GPUs, so you would get this big burst of unloading operations across the data centers that its unloading efficiency would depend on the data center's regional temperature. On the other hand, internet connection is also needed for hardware communication which they have also designed it themselves called a ROS. The key details might be a bit too technical, but they own the design so they just casually shared it in another paper like an absolute chad. To make things even more difficult, since transformers would generate tokens in an autoregressive manner, which just kind of means sequentially but every new output is also conditioned on its previous outputs, this makes it even more difficult for the GPUs to not have downtimes. So a common practice for this is to apply parallelism, and as Llama 3.1 has detailed in its paper, it uses 4D parallelism. The 4D represents tensor parallelism, pipeline parallelism, context parallelism, and data parallelism. Tensor parallelism basically splits individual weight tensors in the model into multiple chunks on different devices. Pipeline parallelism partitions the model vertically into stages by layers so that different devices can process in parallel for different stages of the full model pipeline. Context parallelism divides the input context into segments, reducing memory bottleneck for very long sequences sequence length inputs. And data parallelism splits the data across multiple devices where each device processes different subset of data but use the same parameters, then collect them all back together to update all the parameters. They have a really good illustrations of how these parallelisms connect with each other across GPUs, and note that all GPUs are using FP32 numerical precision to ensure training stability. So with this insane GPU cluster setup, errors are completely bound to happen. In the paper, they have tallied up all the GPU failure keys during the 54 days of training.
training the 405B model. And there are at least one error daily, including firmware updates. The worst type of error here is the silent data corruption, where undetected errors in data occur without triggering any error messages or system crashes. So if you ever want a challenging hardware debugging job in the future, Data Center AI Trainer might be a good one as complexity of hardware failures scales with the amount of GPUs. So finally, we can get to training the model, aka the training recipe. But before we get any deeper, I actually got something interesting to show you. With the current state of AI subscriptions, aren't you tired of canceling or buying multiple subscriptions just to try something out? Well, today's sponsor, Poe, has got your back. This game-changing platform provides you access to all the best AI products in one place, like imagine having Cloud 3.5 Sonnet, Slama 3.1, GPT-40, Gemini 1.5 Pro, Flux.1, and so much more, all for the cost of a single ChatGPT subscription. It's literally perfect for the people that cannot fully decide on which AI they want to commit to pay, and having to jump between subscriptions will no longer be a bother for you. Post multi-bot chat feature lets you combine different AI models in one conversation. Need analysis? Start with Llama 3.1. Want some up-to-date info? Bring in web search. Polishing content? Call in Claude 3.5. Using Poe is like having an AI dream team at your service that is only one at away. I've been testing Poe for helping me understand papers much faster, and it has been really efficient in helping me switching between models. It can also easily break down complex PDFs and analyze the graphs, which is pretty awesome. And for the creators, Poe offers the chance to let you build your own AI bots, reach millions, and even generate revenue. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, you can get started now with Poll using the link down in the description. It is currently available on the web and all app stores, and thank you Poll for sponsoring this video. Anyways, I might have done that on purpose, but let's talk about training recipes. For the model to get better at next token prediction, we need to provide as much textual data as we can for the model to learn the structure of language and obtain as much knowledge about the world from the text it is reading. This phase of the training is called the pre-training phase, where Llama 3.1 was trained on a large multilingual text corpus with a total of 15.6 trillion tokens. But you don't just dump all the 15.6 trillion tokens directly in either. There is actually a three-stage process in pre-training. First stage is the initial pre-training. This stage is to incrementally increase in batch size and sequence length, allowing the model to scale effectively without destabilizing the training process. This recipe has proven to be very stable, with only a handful of lost spikes and minimal interventions needed to correct for any divergence in model training. The second stage is the long context pre-training. So instead of training 128k tokens context length directly from scratch, the common practice now is to start with a smaller context size like 8k in the first stage then scale it up after the model's capabilities have matured. This approach makes the model training a lot more stable and cheaper than training 128k context length from scratch too. The total processes from 8k to 128k context length is also separated into 5 stages, so there is definitely a lot of incremental training going on. Then to see if the second stage is done or not, you can evaluate by checking if the model's performance on short context has recovered completely, along with if the model is able to perfectly solve the needle in the haystack task up to 128k, which is a type of test where the model has to answer a question about something that is only in the context window and the model itself has never learned, then we can head to stage 3. Stage 3 is called annealing, which is to pretty much touch up the quality of the pre-trained model. Model. For the final 40 million tokens, they are using the finest of the fine data and setting the learning rate that goes linearly to zero after a certain amount of steps. However, the end model when the learning rate hits zero is not the model that we will actually use. The true final form of the pre-trained model is actually born from the average value of all the model checkpoints saved during annealing. And that is all for the pre-training phase training recipe. Unfortunately, the main downside about this paper is that Meta did not share the training data mix they have used for Llama 3.1 at all. Some people speculated that this may be to avoid getting sued, but who knows. We'll also get back to the limited information they have shared about their training data later. So after the pre-training phase is done, the AI model is still only able to act like the auto-completion on your phone. We need to make it to do things, like being able to chat with it and make it to be helpful for people like answering their questions. So this is where post-training comes in. In the pre-training stage, the AI is to learn as much as it can, and in the post-training stage, we generally have two main goals. First, it's to make the AI model become more practical, like turn it into a chatbot. Second, it is to make the chatbot produce good responses. So for the former, in order to create human AI interactions, we need to define a chat dialogue protocol for the model to comprehend human 
instructions and perform conversational tasks. For Llama 3.1's case, they have designed new multi-message chat protocol which uses various special header and termination tokens where the header tokens are used to indicate the source and destination of each message in the conversation and the termination tokens indicate when it is the time to alternate between humans and AI to speak. It's kind of like the idea of payload in a network where there are sections of data for specific purposes and it will be meaningless without an agreed upon protocol. And in this case, AI can agree by training on the newly formatted data. It is also at this stage that data becomes harder to come by as it becomes more format specific like having a conversation, giving in instructions, taking in user inputs, and generating outputs, or even calling for toy use where there are dedicated tokens for calling things like calculators. So this is also the point where synthetic data starts to be used more often and they would take the Llama 3AB models they have previously trained to help reformat or generate data for use which we'll get to later. So to train for instruction following, Llama 3.1 used the methods that people nowadays typically employ where different types of AI models will be involved in the process to help improve the main LLM model. And reward modeling is a key component in Llama 3's training process. It involves collecting pairs of model outputs for comparison which are then ranked by human annotators using a 7 point scale. For Llama 3, each sample typically consists of a chosen and a rejected response, with some samples also including an edited response that further improves upon the chosen one. So the reward model is trained on all available preference data and after filtering out samples with similar responses, it learns what qualifies as a high quality output. This resulting reward model plays a crucial role in the overall post-training pipeline. It's used for rejection sampling during supervised fine-tuning and informs the direct preference optimization process. Rejection sampling here basically means that it'll sample randomly and keep only the ones that meet a specific criterion. Since the choosing process is automated by a reward model, you can have the reward model learn to rank a desired condition like a tone, style, or formatting requirements, and the reward model would then be used to perform rejection sampling on both human or synthetic data. This approach is then applied iteratively over six rounds, which would continuously improve the model's capabilities to generate high quality responses aligned with the human preferences by sampling synthetic data from the latest models. Some of you guys might be wondering why they didn't use the proximal policy optimization, which OpenAI proposed a while ago. Well, it turns out that DPO requires less compute for large-scale models and performs better, especially on instruction-following benchmarks. Then, all the experiments using various versions of data or hyperparameters at each reward modeling, SFT or DPO stage are averaged to create the final model. Well, it is indeed unfortunate that they didn't explain how exactly they have obtained their data mix, but they do have some interesting insights to it. The most important fact is that the training data is mainly model-generated, but requires careful cleaning and quality control. For the non-generated data, they remove stuff like excessive use of emojis or exclamation points, removed overly apologetic or bot-like phrases such as I'm sorry or I apologize, removed markdown formatting which is pretty surprising, but apparently it is pretty harmful when the model is primarily trained on the web data. So no more backticks in the prompt for Llama 3. They also downsample data about arts and entertainment which are oversaturated on the internet. And yeah, Llama 3 pretty much used KL diversions that maps the distribution of tokens with respect to a subject to identify tokens that they don't want to include in the training process, which in turn avoids those subjects. For the post-training process, they fine-tune Llama 3 AB into a topic classifier to separate topics like mathematic reasoning or geometry and math. For the reward modeling, a smaller Llama 3 was also fine-tuned for quality scoring to evaluate the synthetic data for supervised fine-tuning. It will rate each sample on a three-point scale for general English data and a two-point scale for coding data. Then they use a super strict evaluation where the synthesized data has to score full points for the data to be used. But that's not enough either. To make the data even higher quality, they also implemented difficulty scoring where it scores data using two measures of difficulty, Instag and Llama 3. This time, they use Llama 370B to measure the difficulty of dialogues on a three-point scale and utilize Instatag to produce intention tagging for the supervised fine-tuning prompts where more intention implies more complexity. But the distribution of these data might become unbalanced, right, since everything is all synthesized and filtered disregarding the data mix. So semantic deduplication is applied to the data. How it works is that it first creates clusters of the data using Robert A where within each cluster, we sort them by quality score cross-product difficulty score. We can then use this semantic mapping in relation 
attention to quality and difficulty to retain a diverse set of high quality data while removing those that are too similar, reducing the redundancy in data and maintaining balance. So this is how they have roughly cleaned their training data and how the Llama 3405B flagship model was created with a bit of a simplification on my end for the sake of fitting it into a video. The paper itself probably contains the current best engineering practices for LLM to this date, so go read it in detail if you need. This video has only covered up to around page 28, and after that, it's the results section, which is around 10 pages long, followed by inference tests on different hardware positions and red teaming up to around page 54. The reason that they didn't make a mixture of experts model was also for maximum training stability. For the rest of the paper, it discusses how they have extended Llama 3.1 model into the multimodality territories. Things like image and video understanding, which might actually be announced with Llama 4, seeing how they have done this with 405B last time. So maybe I'll talk about it when it's out in the future and discuss the difference between an LLM adapter for multimodal, like what they have shown in this paper, and a native O-in-1 encoder multimodal model in another meta research paper called Chameleon. But anyways, thanks for watching. And if you want to keep up with the latest AI research, definitely check out my newsletter where I publish research breakdowns on many cool papers that I don't have time to make videos for. A big shout out to Andrew Lascellias, Chris Ledoux, Alex J, Deegan, Alex Mariz, Migulim, Fafau, Robert Zaviasa, Owen Ingram, Tanaro, and many others that support me through Patreon or YouTube. Follow my Twitter if you haven't, and I'll see y'all in the next one.